God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless everyone, everyone, every one of you. You know my testimony. It does not change. This is the day that the Lord has made. I have purpose. I have decided. I am seizing the day. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless every one of you who are on now and those who will come on um, at some point later on. I wanted to just um, uh, come to let you know that you are engaging, you are embarking on what will be a life-changing move for you. This is not just another time where, well, I'm not going to eat or I need to drop a few pounds or anything. No, this is a season where God is realigning. He is putting things back in line in every facet of our lives. This is not, you know, sometimes people are saying, well, you know, I'm good because I'm in the gym. Well, you're in the gym, but your diet habits are off. So you're going into the gym and that's not doing you any good. Or, well, I'm eating better. Yeah, but you're eating better, but you're not exercising. So that's not working. So then there are others who are eating better and are exercising, but they're still not good when it comes to managing their money. And then there are those who are eating better and are exercising, managing their money, but they're not resting properly. So there is a need for us to be um, completely reset, reestablished, realigned. And that's the reason why the Almighty God gave me this time and this theme of this consecration. And he did it while I was on the holy altar there in Lagos, Nigeria. And he spoke to me while I was in prayer about other things. I was praying about um, some needs that some of the members had asked me to pray about. I was there praying about some of the people who had asked me um, the one couple who wants to have six babies at one time, I was praying for them. I was there praying because one of my spiritual daughters um, has cancer and has gone from stage four now to stage two. Um, and I'm just watching God doing all of these things. And so I was there praying about other things and he placed this concept in my spirit. And that is that this is the year 2023. Three is Trinity. Three makes reference to balance. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he shared with me that this is a year when he is going to get our Trinity, we are spirit, have a soul, live in a body. He's going to bring everything into alignment. Remember, um, John wrote and said, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. So there is a three-pronged um, agenda that the Almighty God wants to deal with us in to get us on course. What good would it do for him to give us what we're asking for financially and then we die prematurely. What good would it do for him to give us health and then we're broke all the time? What good would it do for us to be healthy physically and have the funds that we need, but we don't have a moral compass to know how to do or what to do when it comes to the things of God? And so I simply want to be the one that's going to um, work and walk through this with you as God has walked through this with me. I want to open up with prayer. I was giving um, people an opportunity to come on and I wanted to give you a little bit of time. So let's just go and open up with prayer so I don't hold you longer than the time that I have allotted for tonight. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you so much. I bless you for this privilege. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord God, because we recognize that it's in you that we live. It's in you that we move. It's in you that we have our being. And for this new year, you have asked us to come apart, to have a season where we are separate. You've asked us to 
come apart before we fall apart. We have to come apart before we come apart. And I'm asking daddy that what you are giving us in these days and these times of this season of teaching, I pray my father and my God that it would not just be a formality. It would not just be some religious rituals, but it will be a shift. It will be a change in the lives of each one of your people. Daddy, you have always asked when you came to deal with someone, do you want to be made whole? And daddy, we are asking that you would make us whole in this season. Yes, and my father and my God, anyone that may not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, yes. let them be saved. Anyone that's coming on just out of curiosity, let their appetite be satisfied. Anyone that's coming on and saying, I've never fasted before. Yes. Daddy, let this be the easiest decision that they have ever made. For anyone who is saying, well, I want to do one part, but I don't want to do another. Daddy, I pray that you would help them to know that they have already handicapped themselves and capped what you can do because they have not done a whole, the total of what you're requiring of us. And my Father, I pray that when this season is over, that your name will be glorified, will be built up and be more fortified to the glory of your name and the devil's shame we have prayed. Everyone say amen where you are and amen. Clap your hands and give out God a praise right where you are. Glory to God, glory to God. Well, before I jump into this, can I please share with you where this concept comes from. Where did I get this? If you would look, please, um, in the book of First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, um, if you've done your fast reading and pray that you have looked at everything that's in there, if you look at First Thessalonians, there's something that is very, very powerful in chapter number five, mm -hmm. verse 23. First Thessalonians, chapter number five, mm -hmm. verse 23. Here's how it reads. Now may the God of peace, not the God of wrath, not the God of hostility, not the God of anger, but the God of peace. I'm praying that during this time of consecration that someone is going to recapture their peace. Amen. Someone that is listening to me, someone that is watching me, you are going to be able to walk in peace. No one is going to get on your last nerve. I even come against those who have already gone into an allegiance with the adversary to try and disrupt your peace. Amen. I speak peace be still Amen. over everything that is coming against you mentally, everything that's coming against you emotionally, everything that's coming against you financially, everything that's coming against you relationally, even the people that you're dealing with socially, I speak peace be still. And everything has got to obey and submit to the authority of the word of God that is coming from my mouth over your life in Jesus' mighty name, you will be able to rest peacefully. Amen. You will have peace in your home. You'll have peace in your marriage. You'll have Amen. peace with your children. You'll have peace in your finances. You'll have peace in every facet of your life. I'm speaking this because it says, may the God of peace himself, watch this, sanctify you. What does that word sanctify mean? It means set you apart. Mm -hmm. May he pull you away from. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the God of peace. He is pulling you away. Watch this. And he is setting you up. Here's what the word says. Completely. The King James Version says, may he sanctify you wholly. Yeah. But this new King James says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Here it is. And may your whole spirit, mm -hmm. soul, mm -hmm. and body. There's the Trinity. We are spirit. Mm -hmm. We have a soul. Mm -hmm. We live in the body. So the God of peace himself is calling for us to be pulled away mm -hmm. 
sanctified, consecrated, separated so that he can do this work. What is that work? He wants us in our whole spirit, not a part of our spirit, and our whole soul. If we are mind, will, emotion, desire, intellect, he doesn't want you to just be mentally astute mm -hmm. and to be knowledgeable. And then uh, three other parts of your um, trinity are messed up. He says, no, I want to sanctify you completely mm -hmm. and may your whole spirit, soul and body, here it is, be preserved. I'm taking each word because my mama, who was my first English teacher, taught me never to read whole paragraphs, don't read whole sentences. While I was a stuttering, stammering child, she would say, go ahead and just read each word because it is giving birth as you're speaking. So it says, be preserved. Mm -hmm. Preserved means that something is being kept. I'm praying that you will be kept. Here it is. I am praying that you will not die prematurely. Amen. I am praying that you are not going to have any unexpected illnesses. There will be no unexpected problems in your body. I'm speaking to someone's blood. Mm -hmm. Even right now, it's showing some sign of pollutant but the almighty God has sent his word to heal you mm -hmm. and deliver you. I'm speaking to someone right now. Um, you've been having difficulty and you're thinking that it's your allergy, but this is not even your allergy season, but you're calling it allergy because that is the easiest term that you have. I'm speaking right now for your breathing to be clear. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking for your nostrils to be unstopped. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking right now for your ears to be unstopped, ear, nose, and throat. They're all connected. I'm speaking that to be well with you right now. It says he will preserve you. Somebody say, I'm kept. I'm kept. I'm kept. When I was coming up, um, James Cleveland had a song that he sang that um, everybody had sung, Claire Ward, everyone. And the song said, oh, to be kept by Jesus. And there is something for him to keep you later on much, much later on, we used to sing a song in the old location saying, he'll keep you in perfect peace yeah. if you just keep your mind stayed mm -hmm. on him. And by the time we got to the end, we were singing, he's a keeper. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. So somebody needs to know that God is sending this word to you for you to be sanctified, holy, completely, and your whole spirit, which comes from God and cannot sin, mm -hmm. your whole soul, your mind, will, emotions, desire, and intellect, and your whole body, your whole body, every part of your anatomy is going to be preserved. Amen. How is that? Blameless, meaning that nothing in your spirit, mm -hmm. nothing in your emotions, nothing in your body is going to keep you from making it to glory. Amen. You're not only going to be kept in this life, but you'll be kept for the life to come. Mm -hmm. Here's what it says. It will be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that what I'm speaking over you now and what God wants to do with us during this consecration, this is not a one night stand. This is not something that's going to happen now and we're going to slide back. Come on, somebody just say with me, no more backsliding, no more backsliding. What God is doing with us in this year, 2023, mm -hmm. Trinity, as he is preserving our Trinity mm -hmm. in the year of the Trinity, we are being kept until his return. Amen. Now, I want you all to hold on to this, hold on to this, hold on to this, because the question would be, the question would be, um, why would there be a need, um, co-pastor, mm -hmm. for God to even bring us to this season for this time of consecration so that we can have this done concerning our trinity? 
It is because, it is because when you look at Daniel chapter number five, Daniel chapter number five, mm -hmm. it tells us of a king by the name of Belshazzar who came on the scene after it was kind of like his uncle grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. You all remember Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one that built the tall gold statue and told the Hebrew children they had to bow down. And um, he was the one that got so full of himself um, until he's, people talked and said, oh, that's the voice of a God. And he was acting like he was a God. And God made him lose his mind. Here's the text. He lost his mind for seven years, mm -hmm. ran out into the field, but naked, was eating grass like an animal. His hair grew long, his fingernails grew long, and all of his subjects watched him mm -hmm. out there living like an animal. Bible says after seven years of being out there, God gave him a window of sanity he said, there's no God like God. I want you all to hear this because it shows the extreme love of God. His subjects who were in the palace watching their king for seven years eat grass like an ass, walked out, got him, brought him back into the palace, shaved him, manicured him, cleaned him up bathed him, sat him on the throne and bowed to him and said, your majesty. Mm -hmm. Why did I say that? Because that was at a time when kings were going to war and were taking kingdoms. Yet for seven years, God held his position. Nobody took his throne. Nobody took his authority. And when he came to himself, he was restored to the very place that he had lost as a result of his arrogance. I'm speaking to someone right now. God wanted me to tell you that story because you're thinking that you've missed some opportunities and that they're just gone, that you've made so many mistakes and there's nothing that can be done. God told me to tell you that if he could keep a kingdom secure, and a throne vacant while he allowed the process of a king to go from insane to coming back to reign that there is nothing that he has promised you that he can't restore to you when you come back to the right mind. I'm praying for you right now. And I'm asking you right where you are, Put your hand on your own head and say, Lord, don't let me lose my mind. Don't let me lose my mind. Don't let me lose my mind. I'm praying that as God keeps you sane, that you will every day make your declaration that there's no God like our God. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wound up saying. He got everything restored. And the bad part about it is that now here comes Belshazzar, his grandson, nephew, mm -hmm. who saw what his uncle um, grandfather went through and didn't learn his lesson. So much so that he had made so much money. He was balling out. He was living large. And he said, I'm going to throw a party for me. Go fast. He was doing so well. He didn't wait for nobody to celebrate him. Uh -huh. He says, I'm going to celebrate myself. Yes. Here's the mistake that he made. And the height of the party. Mm -hmm. He was drunk, as the old folks say, as Cootie Brown. Mm -hmm. He told his servants, go over into the temple mm -hmm. and bring the holy goblets that are reserved for God mm. and bring them in here. I'm going to take the vessels that belong to God, fill them with wine so I can satisfy my lustful appetite. Mm. I don't know if you all can see the connection and the implication. Mm. He took the vessels that was supposed to be set aside for God mm -hmm. and use the vessels that were set aside for God mm -hmm. to enjoy himself in his party. Well, don't you know that your body 
is the temple and the dwelling place mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't you know that the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen mm -hmm. vessels? Mm -hmm. And yet some of us are taking these vessels that are supposed to be in the house of God and they're in the halls of ill repute. We've taken these vessels that are supposed to be in the house of God and they are in clubs, they are everywhere. And we fill these vessels with every kind of thing except the spirit of God. Have you ever wondered why that the liquor stores will say wine, beer, and spirits mm -hmm. on them? Mm -hmm. Because alcohol is a controlling spirit. That's why the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. He is showing the comparison between wine and the spirit. When people have gotten so drunk, they don't have control. They don't know what they're doing. They don't remember various things. Well, likewise, when you are filled with the spirit, you are now yielding control to him. You no longer remember your past and your failures because they're under the blood and you are now in the hands of another entity. I'm praying that just as we had communion last night, mm -hmm. I'm praying that you will yield your body and your soul to the spirit of God so that, you know, there are some people that when they get drunk, they, they, they black out. They don't remember various things. Well, you need to understand that when you are filled with the Holy Ghost of God, that your past is no longer the thing that you ought to remember. And guess what? As we go along, neither should you be remembering somebody else's past. If God has forgiven you of yours and wiped it away, he is asking you to do the same thing for others. Here's what the Bible says, because at the height of the party, and I'm about where I need to be before we start praying, mm -hmm. at the height of the party, suddenly an uninvited guest showed up. You'll see this. In Daniel chapter number five, beginning at verse number 13, Daniel five, verse 13, it says that something started happening. Okay. What started happening was at the height of the party, all of a sudden, a man's hand shows up in the room. A huge hand, no invitation, and the finger goes over to the concrete wall, the marble wall, and starts writing a message on the wall. The king got shook and said, I need somebody to interpret it. The interpreter said, there's a man in your palace who knows how to interpret things like this. They went and got Daniel. They then came and brought Daniel in, and the king said, I will pay you so, so, so amount if you just go ahead and interpret this. I'll make you this position and that position. That's why you've got to be careful that money is not your motivation because then you will compromise your ministry. You will compromise your integrity. You will do anything if it means getting you money. You'll tell a little white lie, it's not that serious. No, Daniel said to him, Daniel said, because he said, um, I've heard of you, verse 16, I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you'll be clothed with purple, that's royalty. You'll have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Verse 17, Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. Mm -hmm. Give your rewards to another. I'm going to read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. I, and, and then he goes on and says, you didn't learn the lesson. That's why I put it in there for you all to read this story. You didn't learn the lesson of the previous king, your ancestor. You didn't learn from what they went through. How many of you are watching and listening to me right now and you saw stuff happen to your grandmother, happen to your mother, happen to your grandfather, 
happened to your father. You saw what certain habits did to your auntie, did to your cousin. You watched what happened to certain people that were close to you, and yet you still keep saying, but that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. I can stop when I get ready. I can stop whenever I feel like it. But you haven't. And it's getting worse and worse. The Bible says that when you get down to verse number 25, I'm going to tell you what Daniel said. You read the rest of this on your own. That may be something you want to include in your hour time. It says in verse number 25, um, let's look at verse 24. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel, yepharsin. Verse 26. This is the interpretation of each word. Mine, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Literally, he is saying, King, all that you have right now is as far as you're going. This was literally a death sentence, meaning there's no more prosperity. There's nothing else you're going to do. You've come to the end of your road. Tekel, verse 27, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Mm -hmm. The old folk used to say, you're light in your pants. What this is literally saying is that you're not balanced. You've been put on a scale and you've got more of this than you do of that. And the scales are not even. This is where we got the, the concept from the almighty God that this year, 2023, spirit, soul, body has got to be realigned Readjust it and put back in balance. We lost a lot during the pandemic, those who did not maintain their spirituality. You found yourself emotionally on edge, couldn't stand being around people spiritually. You were ready to throw in the towel. Some have walked away from church, some have given up their entire Christian walk. There's some that are hanging on by a thread saying, maybe if I just send my offering in, I can still have a connection with the ministry. You're struggling to really maintain your spiritual focus and your foundation has cracks in it. You have been found wanting. That's why we are doing this type of consecration because the almighty God wants to bring us back. Mm -hmm. He is giving us this opportunity. He is telling us that yes, it's your spirit, soul, and body. Yes, it's been found wanting, you're off balance, but there is hope for you. Mm -hmm. There is an opportunity starting today for us to get it together. So that's why we're here. And this consecration, it is 12 days. How many days did I say? Yeah. 12 days. Each day is going to represent one of the months of the year. Mm -hmm. So if you see what we are doing on day one, mm -hmm. that's going to be what we will be ministering in January. Day two is what we'll be dealing with in February. Day three is what we will be dealing with in March and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And we'll be opening up the word as God gives it to us so that we can share with you how to get balanced during the course of this year. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna to have to wait until December in order to get the things that God has promised us because we are not completely unbalanced in every area. Some are going to be back on track before the middle part of February. Some others are gonna be back on track before spring comes. 
Some others are going to be back on track before we even make it out of August. A few are going to have to go through the entire year because they have done absolutely nothing for the past two years in order to build themselves up in their most holy faith. Mm -hmm. I'm praying that as a result of whoever you are being a part of this consecration and putting your whole self, your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body into it, then God will not have to make you go through the entirety before you start getting the stuff that you have been asking for and that you've been believing him for. If you're that individual, shout, Lord, work quickly on me. So now, tonight we start. May I please thank Samara and Janice for making this possible for us to do it. We're starting with the first quarter. Now, if this is broken down in quarters, that means that it is in fours. And in each quarter, there are three particular areas that we'll deal with. Why? Three times four is 12. And that will be the month that we're dealing with. And so tonight we are beginning in the first quarter, but it is day one or the things that we would be dealing with in the month of January. And the sermons will reflect that. And then day two is going to be going on as I share with you. Mm -hmm. So here we are now. And what we're doing is we are dealing with character development. Mm -hmm. Character development. Now we haven't got, we're, we're not even getting into the spirit, the soul and the body because they will start picking up in the second, the third and the fourth quarter. But the first quarter is dealing with the foundation. Do you know that it does no good to have a wonderful roof if you've got cracks in the foundation of your house? That's true. It does no good to say, I picked out these beautiful drapes but you've got water coming in every time it rains in your basement. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that our foundation is right before we start trying to build. Remember, Jesus told the story of how some people build their houses on sand. And that's good as long as no rain comes. But then those who built their homes on a rock, even when the rain came, it couldn't knock it out. So let's go through these prayer arrows, just five prayer arrows. You're going to have for each prayer arrow, just about two minutes, if that long, to pray the prayer. And um, we're going to be moving through these very quickly. You know how to pray. So we are going to move through it swiftly. We are dealing with character development. And day one is dealing with the concept of introspection. What do we mean by introspection? Mm -hmm. Introspection um, is an examination mm -hmm. of one's what? Own thoughts yeah. and feelings. I think it's important, Co-Pastor, mm -hmm. that as we begin to get into this area of consecration, set aside, fasting, dealing with our foundation, that we don't start dealing with what somebody did to us. Mm -hmm. My father wasn't there. My mother didn't do this. No, introspection means I've got to deal with an examination of my own thoughts and my own feelings. Yeah. Watch this, taking into consideration who might not have been there. I can't keep blaming them. I've got to now deal with what have I become? as a result of a broken marriage, a broken home, an aborted child, an early pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, a rape, um, a drug addiction, uh, um, an abuse by a parent, mm -hmm. um, uh, a prison time. What, what, how, how have I been shaped in my thinking? And how do I want those things to keep on shaping my life? Some of us, co-pastor, have mm -hmm. had things happen when we were children. Right. I can think very easily about some things that have happened in my life. Yeah. And 
if I'm not careful, I will keep on reverting to that episode yes. and never break away from it. Yes. And all of my actions as a grown man mm -hmm. will go back to when I was mishandled as a young boy yes. until I deal with an examination of my own thoughts, I will keep making myself a victim mm -hmm. and making everybody else around me having to pay for what happened to me that I'm not even willing to let go of now. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to get into our day one prayer of our introspection. And it is, it is the passage of scripture in 2 Samuel, chapter number 12, verse five and six. Second okay. Samuel, chapter number 12, verse five and six. You'll know that story because that is the story of when Pastor Nathan came to the home of David and said to David, hey, I haven't seen you in church lately. Haven't, haven't seen you coming out and David was telling him, well, you know, being a king, you know, I'm busy, thus and such and such. And so Pastor Nathan said, well, let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. And the story is that there was a man mm -hmm. who was very wealthy and had a whole lot of flocks. And his next door neighbor had only one little ewe lamb, just one. And he loved that one little lamb like it was his own daughter. Well, the wealthy man, the big time guy, he messed around when some guests came to his house. He took the one little ewe lamb that his next door neighbor had, didn't touch the whole herd of sheep he had. He took the one little lamb that his next door neighbor had, killed it, dressed it, and fed it to his guests. David said, in my kingdom, there's somebody like that in my kingdom, the guy that would do something like that should surely die, as you have it on the screen for you. He said, a guy like that needs to die. He needs to restitute, pay that man back, and he needs to die. And Pastor Nathan said, David, you're the man. I made you king. I put you in a position. I gave you what your father, um, I, you, you are in a spot that you didn't even merit, didn't even deserve, I gave it to you. And I gave you all of these women. I gave you everything you wanted. And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more. All you had to do was ask. But you took um, that one wife, you put her husband on the front line and you took the wife and then you impregnated her and then tried to act like you were doing a good thing by pulling her into your house. Mm -hmm. you, you put her husband on the front line to have him killed. He had more integrity than you because when you brought him off the front line to try to make him sleep with his wife, mm -hmm. he says, I can't sleep with her because my buddies are out on the field fighting. Mm -hmm. And now, David, you've messed up. You have messed up. We're going to pray our first prayer arrow because David was confronted. Yes. And when David was confronted, he, David was confronted. And when he was confronted, he saw himself for who he was. And watch this. Suddenly, the anger of somebody, they should surely die. It got softer because he recognized he was the one that was guilty. Wow. You're going to now pray your first prayer arrow. This is a part of your character development. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, Father, the grace mm -hmm. to temper all of my conversations with mercy. Let that be my portion. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm saying that is because some of us, as long as we got the high hand and the heavy hand, we are hard on people. Then when it comes our way, we say, that's different. It's not the same thing. Oh, you want everybody to go to hell when they're wrong. You want everybody to be guilty when they mess up. You want everybody to have to pay you back. But then when it comes your way, well, no, it's not the same thing. I, no, I didn't do what you did. It's uh-uh. You're going to have to have your character develop. I know while I'm talking that some of you have run some scenarios through your mind. You can't, you can't admit it. I understand. Get it right with God. You don't have to get it right with Brother Sturdivant. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to get that thing right because you are quick 
to damn everybody else, your self-righteousness, your sense of I'm owed something always lets you bring the hammer down heavy on everybody else. You bring the hammer down heavy on your son, your daughter. You bring the hammer down heavy on your spouse, your companion. You bring the hammer down heavy when somebody cuts you off or doesn't pay you back in time. Yet, when it's you, you want to please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I'm praying for you and you pray this prayer. You've got 30 seconds. Pray this prayer. Say, Father, the grace, the grace to temper all of my conversation, for all of my conversation. With, mercy. with mercy. Let that be my portion tonight. Let that be my portion. Go ahead, pray now, my Father and my God. Oh my God, the, the ability, the ability, the ability. I need the grace to temper all of my conversation. Oh my God, I, I'm always so angry. I'm always so quick. I am always so swift with my tongue. Daddy, I pray in the name of Jesus, let everything that I say be tempered. Give me the grace to let everything be tempered with mercy, considering myself. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, and so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's make it personal. Come on, somebody say, so shall it be for me in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It has got to be tempered with mercy. Amen. You're so hard on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And do you know why you're hard on everybody else? Because you have not dealt with certain things. We're going to see that as we go along. Amen. Prayer arrow number two. You're going to see in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 1 through 7, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. The whole time that Pastor Nathan was preaching the message, go oh, Pastor, mm -hmm. David had missed coming to the temple. Mm -hmm. So the pastor brought the message to his house. Mm -hmm. There are some of you right now that are on here mm -hmm. and you haven't been to the temple, the church. Mm -hmm. But by coming on to this Zoom, it's come to your house. Amen. I am Pastor Nathan tonight because since you won't leave your house mm. to come to where God is, God says, I'm going to come to your house because no one's confronting you. No one's checking you. No one is dealing with you because you keep staying behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And when you go out, you go to be around people that enable you. Mm -hmm. And no one is dealing with the flaws in your character. God has sent me here so that I can help you to move from where you are. Mm -hmm. When David was at his home, Pastor Nathan came and said to him, you are the man you are the neighbor i'm talking about you're the one that's guilty of that mm -hmm. and watch what david says the bible says so david said to nathan i have sinned against the lord mm -hmm. notice what david did not say the woman should have been bathing outside if she didn't want me to look at her and then lust after her and then pull her into the house and have sex with her she should have been bathing from her monthly cycle behind closed doors. See, David could very easily try to blame somebody, but here's the other part of that blame. David, if you would have been where you were supposed to be out in the field fighting, it didn't matter where she was bathing because you wouldn't have seen her. See, we are always quick to blame somebody else for what they have done. But have you ever looked at what part you played in causing them to do what they've done? Come on, sis. I know you're hard on your man, but what did you do that made your man like he is? Hey, bro, I know you're hard on your lady, but what did you do that made her like she is? Oh, I know your children are a certain way, but you do know that they were being watered by those actions in your life when you were coming in inebriated, when you were coming in a certain way. 
They never saw me when I was high, when I was drunk. Yes, but you do know that spirits are in the bloodline. I'm telling you that David, when he was confronted, David said, I have sinned against the Lord. He did not blame the woman. He did not blame Pastor Nathan. He did not blame my family got a strong sex drive. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And I'm praying that someone that's watching, listening me, will start taking ownership for your actions and that you'll stop blaming your husband, stop blaming your wife, stop blaming your children, stop blaming your auntie, stop blaming your uncle, stop blaming, I, I confess that they didn't offer me lunch that day, stop finding somebody to blame and own that you just are undisciplined, you are weak in certain areas of your life and that you need to get your trinity balanced because it's not balanced. Lift your voice to the almighty God and pray this prayer. Say, Father, Father the, strength of character the strength of character to admit my own failures. Admit my own failures. Grant that to me tonight. To me. It's a character weakness when yes. you can't accept your fault that you have played. Come on, Father, the strength of character yes. to admit my own failures, yes. grant it to me tonight. You've got 30 seconds, pray. My Father and my God, my character is weak. I'm always, whenever someone confronts me, I flip the script, I deflect. I want to point out what they either did or did not do or what they should have been that they were not. Father, give me the strength of character to admit the part that I have played in every situation that I am confronted with. Grant me, my Father and my God, that kind of strength. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. So shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, make it personal. So shall it be for me in Jesus', in name. Jesus name. Amen. David was literally saying, I'm sorry. Amen. And I know that those two words are hard for some to say to certain people. You can say, I'm sorry, man is sorry when you're talking to your grandkids. You can say, I'm sorry when you're talking to your nephew. Man, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry. Why is it so hard for you to say, I'm sorry to your spouse? Why is it so hard for you to say, I'm sorry to your child? Why is it so hard for you to say, I'm sorry to your mom, to your dad? There is a blockage that is a flaw and the weakness of your character yes. that you cannot admit your failures mm -hmm. to people unless they are people that you have some control over. One of the things that I have found is that a sacrifice is not a sacrifice unless it hurts for you to let it go. There are some things you've given up to God very easy, but you've already said it'd be a cold day in hell before you forgive certain people. And therefore, I'm going to show you some things that are going to shock you as we go along. We're now moving on to character development, arrow three. It's in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. There was a man that came to Jesus. You read the scripture, read the story, you get an opportunity. He comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times? Can my brother mess up, come back and apologize, and I forgive him? Should I do that seven times? Because seven is the number of completion. That ought to be enough. You have to seven times to hell with him and everybody else. And the Lord said to him, no, I'm not telling you seven times. I'm telling you 70 times seven. You mean 490 times? No. He is saying, don't keep count. Forgive as often as they 
come to you. You know that there's some of you right now that you have already found it easy to forgive somebody that you've slept with, but you can't forgive somebody you've made a commitment to. You forgive somebody that owes you a thousand dollars because you've got something going with them, but you can't forgive your child who took 10. And that's been 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. See, we have selective amnesia. And we have had, as I've, you've heard me tell before on these same teaching platforms, we have decided who we will forgive and who we won't forgive, who we will let have another chance and who we won't have another chance. I'm praying that you will have the ability to understand that if God, that David wrote and said, Lord, if you marked our transgressions, who could stand? Mm -hmm. I pray that the almighty God does not deal with you the way you're dealing with your children mm -hmm. and your spouse mm -hmm. and your coworker and your mother and your father and those that are close to you. And how dare you have this mindset towards your children, your spouse, your mother, your father, all of these. And as soon as somebody died, you want to weep and wail as if you actually love them. You know that some of the greatest and loudest crying that you hear at funerals and home goings are because people now have to deal with the fact that I no longer have a chance to get that right. And now they've got to deal with the guilt of that person having died and they never got a chance to tell them, I love you, or I'm sorry, or you were right, or I forgive you, or don't worry about the money. We have fallen out with people over small things. But this consecration is saying that you've got to get your trinity back balanced. So our third prayer arrow is going to be, Father, tonight, give me a flashback of all that you have forgiven me of so that I can release others of what I think think I am owed. Yeah. If God gave you a flashback of all of the times that you said, God, I swear this time I ain't never going to do it again. Mm -hmm. I swear I'm going to have this child and then you aborted another. Mm -hmm. I swear I'm never going back and then you went back over there again. I swear this is the last time I'm going to drink and then you had another. I swear if you get me out of this hospital, I'm going to be faithful to you. And you still ain't been faithful to him. If you let this job come through, you ain't going to worry about me having to be no title or first fruit giver. And you got jobs and promotions and nothing still has happened. Mm -hmm. If you give me this car, God, I'm going to pick folk up and bring them to church. And now you won't even drive it to church. If God gave you a flashback, mm -hmm. how would you hold up mm -hmm. when it comes to you not wanting to forgive somebody over and over again? How many times has God forgiven you? Lift your voice. You've got 30 seconds to pray this prayer. Say, Father, tonight, give me a flashback of all of the times that you have forgiven me so that I can release others that I think owe me something. Go ahead, pray right now, my Father and my God. Oh, God, give me a flashback. Show me, show me if I'm so arrogant. If I'm so prideful, if I'm so proud until I can't forgive my brother, my sister, my wife, my children, oh my God, give me a flashback and show me all of the times, even when I didn't ask for forgiveness, you forgave me as though it didn't happen. You did it. Give me a flashback and help me to release others of their owing me the same way that you released me owing you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I said, so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so shall it be. Make it personal for me Amen. in Jesus' Amen. mighty name. Amen. We're going to prayer arrow number four. Prayer Amen. arrow number four. Amen. Can you all see the progression yes. of each thing? From prayer arrow one, now to prayer arrow four. Yes. We're now at prayer arrow four, and that is in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Mm -hmm. Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Mm -hmm. When you read the story, there is a Pharisee 
that goes up into church. Mm -hmm. And when he gets there, he sees a publican, a sinner, who is standing afar off. The Pharisee walks right up to the front. Mm -hmm. The publican, he stands way off to the side. Mm -hmm. The publican has his head down mm -hmm. and he's smoting, smiting, beating his chest, mm -hmm. saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee sees him over here. And when he sees him, he's not dropping his head. He, he, he's not praying that kind of prayer. Listen at this prayer in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And as he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, he said, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed this way with himself. Mm -hmm. He prayed with himself. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's not really talking to God. He's talking to himself as if he's God. Mm -hmm. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God be merciful on me a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know that there are some people that will look down on an adulterer, and yet they don't realize that they have a self-righteous mindset. You know that there are some people that will look down on the girl who um, has gotten pregnant, and they are the same ones who, yeah, they're married now. Yeah, they've got a good man. And the only reason why there was no sign that they got pregnant is because they aborted babies and they um, did away with them so that now they can look good while they're in church. There are some people who have never been in jail, but sir, the only reason why you didn't get caught was because your boy didn't rat you out and the police could not catch you. What I'm trying to tell you is you've got to make sure that you are not going around parading yourself as if you're better than somebody else. Our prayer arrow is going to be on this wise. It's going to be, Father, remove pride and arrogance far from me that is masquerading as self-confidence. Wow. See, I know there are a lot of you that are saying, I'm just confident. You just can't handle my confidence. I'm sorry if my confidence offends you. Yeah, but you're one of the nastiest people. You've got the slickest tongue. You, you are looking down on every young person that's smoking weed. You're looking down on every person that's got an issue. You're always looking down on somebody. You're always saying something out the side of your mouth to somebody. And here it is. You are saying it to people because you know that other people have more God in them and they would never talk to you that way. Mm -hmm. And there are some of you that are watching, listening to me right now. And if you're not the one, you know somebody that's like what I'm talking about, that you have held their secret. You have never exposed them. You have never said anything that you knew about them. You've got pictures and documents, yet they've tried to do everything they could to expose you because they could not handle how well people spoke of you. Yeah, but if you knew her like I knew her, if you knew him like I knew him, you ain't married to her. You ain't married to him. You ain't got to live with him. How many things has God had to just cover you in and how many People have covered you so that you can have the arrogance that you have. Lift your voice. 30 seconds to pray this prayer. You'll say, Father, remove pride and arrogance far from me that is masquerading as self-confidence. Go ahead and pray. My Father and my God, I've been acting like I'm strong. 
And the truth of the matter is I'm prideful. I've been acting like I don't need anybody. And the truth of the matter is I'm arrogant. Father, I try to act like I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. And the truth of the matter is I've got pride running through me more than I've got blood running through me. But tonight, my Father and my God, I am asking that she would take it away from me. Take it out of my life. Take it away from me. Remove pride from me before it destroys me. Before I fall. Remove it now. Before it exposes me. Help me to walk in humility. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Yes, Lord. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just make it personal. And so shall it be for me Amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Our final prayer arrow is this. And it is in Matthew chapter number six, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter six, verse 12. I know. I know. You looking down on everybody else. Most times people are looking on somebody because they were too afraid to do the sin that the other person got caught in. Did you hear what I just now said? Sometimes we are looking down on somebody else and it's not that we didn't want to do it. It was just that we were too afraid to try it. We would have been the same, the exact same thing if we weren't afraid to try, if somebody would have wanted us, if somebody would have given us the invitation. Nobody gave you the invitation. Right. Nobody presented it to you. And now you're mad and look down on everybody else as if you're righteous. And the truth of the matter is, it's not that you are righteous, you're lonely. Yeah. And because of what you don't have, you look down on what somebody else has and or is doing. The bad part about that is that the Bible says in Matthew chapter six, verse 12, you remember this, this is not the Lord's prayer, it's the prayer that the Lord taught us to pray. Mm -hmm. He said, when you pray, pray on this wise, say, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily bread, all inclusive and forgive us, our debts, here it is, as we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive me what I owe you to the degree that I forgive others who I think owe me. Mm -hmm. So if you, sir, are still holding things against your wife because of a mistake that she has made, God says, I'm still holding the things you've asked forgiveness for against you. And if you, sweetheart, still have not been able to forgive the man in your life, your husband, God says, all your prayers that you've been praying, that's why you haven't gotten anything because I'm holding it against you. And until you can release her, release him with your whole heart, I can't release what you've been asking me for. Mm -hmm. Could it be that you are the hindrance? to what you've been believing. God, why is it taking so long? Question is, who are you still holding something against? The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. Here's your last prayer arrow. Father, remove the blinders from my eyes yes. that I might see that I have been the hindrance to you responding to my prayers. Yes. Because I won't forget. Some of you all are mad at people that are dead. You haven't forgiven your father for what he did to your mother. You haven't forgiven your mother for letting your grandmother raise you. Newsflash. Sometimes your parents did you a favor by giving you to somebody else because they knew they were in no shape to raise you themselves. Sometimes the person that is in your life gave you the best that you've got. You're still holding something against him, sweetheart, and he has made you live better than you would have ever lived with anybody that you ever dated. Sir, you're still mad at her, and she has get you would have gotten with the girl you, you wanted to get with, but she couldn't have produced a single child because her womb had gotten damaged in one of her abortions. I'm telling you that there are things that you don't know that God did that puts you in the position where you are and you ought to be grateful yeah. for whoever is in your life right now because they only know the parts of you 
that God has allowed them to see. They don't know the parts of you that God let you get out of before they met you and covered you so they never saw them. Mm -hmm. Lift your voice, this final prayer arrow, and say, Father, remove the blindness from my eyes so that I can see that I've been my own hindrance. Go ahead, pray now, Father. Father, everything that I have done, it's nobody's fault. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister, it's not my brother, it's not my spouse, it's not my ex. It's not the children, Father, it is me. Help me to see that I have been the holder. And then, Daddy, as I acknowledge that I've been the holder, I pray that you would wash my eyes with precious sand. Yes, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me. Let me never be one that's pointing fingers at anybody else again. Jesus. Help me to accept the role that I have played and everything I'm blaming someone for. Jesus. Help me to accept the role that I played. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Amen. Beloveds, I pray that this season of prayer has been good. It amen. took me a little time just for the introduction. I won't have to do the introduction on tomorrow night mm -hmm. because I've done that on tonight. I'm mm -hmm. encouraging you to invite all of your family members in mm -hmm. because this is not an ordinary phase. This is not an ordinary consecration. Yeah. This is something that everybody in your family needs. Why? We're going into generational curses and bloodlines through these prayers. We're getting at the root. The Bible says the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Mm -hmm. We're getting down in everything that has made us be unbalanced so that we can get the breakthrough, whether it be financial. Some of your sicknesses are as a result of an imbalance mm -hmm. in your trinity. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that are happening, you haven't gotten certain jobs, you haven't been able to get the promotions. There's an imbalance, and you're a good spiritual person, but in your soulless realm, you still got too much lip, you got too much mouth. There are things that are imbalanced. You beat people up with the word of God. You're arrogant. There are things that we've got to get a balance in so that we can get everything that God has for us. Now, remember, every day you are setting aside one hour of prayer. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's less than the time that is required because if there are 24 hours in a day, literally, we owe God 2.4 hours of doing nothing mm -hmm. but worshiping and honoring him. I'm simply asking you to do one hour. Jesus said to the disciples, could you not watch with me for one hour? He was asking, can't you do the bare minimum? And for each one of us, when you do that one hour, you're going to be setting aside whatever, for whatever job you are on, you are setting aside what you would make for one hour. Mm -hmm. I'm asking each of us, um, as you read the packet, please go back and read it and don't just go by what you're hearing me say. Mm -hmm. Because Paul writes and says, I'm not saying for someone to be burdened and somebody to not be burdened, but an equality. We will not be giving the same thing because everybody makes something different, but we will all be equally sacrificing. It's just like when you give a tithe. A tithe is off of whatever you get on your check. Most of you all make so much more than I do, but it will seem like God is doing so much more for me than he is for you because I'm not going to argue with him about what I have to give so that he doesn't put a cap on it. If God gives you $500 and you give a tithe, that's 50. If God gives you $5,000 and then you say, I can't give no $500 tithe, and you have shown God, God, keep me at 500 because I'll never be faithful when you give me more than 500. You make God limit when you don't do what you can do. 
I'm one that um, I don't I don't get um, a salary like that. But just this past week, um, I went and ministered, and I got two thousand dollars. Well, two thousand dollars. If I take that down and break it down to a forty-hour week, because I got that for that week, I would then have to figure out if I'm working forty hours and I got two thousand, then I've now got to say how many, how much is forty going into two thousand. Then I've got to set aside whatever that would be for one hour when I talk with God. So you have to set aside whatever your one hour is. And I didn't, I didn't specify whether it was from your part-time job, your full-time job, because some are going to try to find the cheapest way to get out when it comes to God. But don't cheapen God when he gave his most precious gift, his son, for you. Cole, you want to say something before I go off, please? Just real briefly, Pastor. You started off with this character is just awesome. Um, if we can develop our character, the best of us, we can easily be built. Yeah, absolutely. And this was a great start um, in our foundation of deliverance in this, uh, during this day. So this is awesome. This part right here is already starting off good. It's going to be really good. Amen. Our character has got to be developed. I'm telling you, this thing messed me up. I'm, I, yeah. I told you, as you know, I haven't been sleeping. Right. And um, when God is downloading this stuff into you, he, God's got a big foot. He says in, in Isaiah 66 and one, heaven mm -hmm. is his throne, earth is his footstool. Yes. That means that he's got a foot that's big enough to rest on the world. When God puts his foot in your behind, mm -hmm. as he's been doing me, mm -hmm. I can't bring you anything light because if God comes at us hard, it's because he wants to release something big. Mm -hmm. I pray that you receive it. Mm -hmm. I pray that you walk it out. Amen. I pray that you get all of your family involved in it. Amen. I pray that you will be better as we go through this consecration together. Amen. Don't let the adversary stop you short. Because if you say, well, I'm just going to do six of the months. But what if God says, I'm only going to let you live for six months this year? Wow. Wow. But what if you say, well, I'm going to do this, but not that. And God says, well, I'll just, I'll let you wake up in the morning, but I won't let you get out of bed because I'll paralyze you. Wow. You know, so now you can be spiritual mm. and your soul is from is good, but I'm just going to tap your body. Mm. And I'll let your body be unable to get out of bed, paralyzed, but your spiritual and your mind, will, emotion, desires, and intellect stay intact. Wow. We need to be completely balanced in every facet of our lives. Once again, thank you, Samara. Thank you, Janice. Um, thank all of you who came on. Mm. Tomorrow night, we'll be right back again at 7 o'clock saturday the same thing sunday at four o'clock mm -hmm. and then monday we'll be back again at seven tuesday mm -hmm. at seven wednesday we will not be on the zoom right. we're going to be doing our regular midweek teaching so that i can continue that ministry mm -hmm. that we're doing and then thursday at seven friday at seven saturday mm -hmm. at seven sunday four o'clock mm -hmm. and then monday we will be doing seven o'clock and we will then be doing our communion as well now i need all of you to please make sure that you resubmit to um my email address um pastor jes ministries at gmail please put that on there and um I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I've got your proper address. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have the, the packets ready um, uh, on that last Sunday. What is that? The 15th? Mm -hmm. That Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have the packets ready. We'll be in service that day. I have the packets ready for those of you that will be there. But if you're out of this area mm -hmm. and you want me to mail it to you, I need you to make sure that all of those are into me by this coming Sunday. Please don't say, oh, I forgot. Can I give it to you now? I am on a schedule with mailing and I've got to mix my oils and put my packets together. And I don't want to at the last minute be doing anything. Thank you all so much for understanding and working with me. God bless you. Amen. Have a blessed evening. Be blessed is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Bye-bye now.